Australia has tightened its vaping laws in a bid to crack down on the illegal use and sale of nicotine vaping products. From Friday, it became illegal to buy items such as nicotine e-cigarettes, nicotine pods and liquid... Lic- Get it right, Tracy. Liquid nicotine from overseas and locally without a prescription. Until now, people have been permitted to import up to three months' worth. But what about all those people who are trying to give up cigarettes by using vapes? What does that mean? Joining me on the line now is Senator Holly Hughes. Good morning and thanks for your time, Holly. Morning, Tracy. I tell you what, darling, New South Wales politics is making the federal parliament look like a bit of a play, play area at the moment. Look, we like to keep things nice and calm and (laughs) even-handed. Thank (laughs) God somebody is. (laughs) Was that a shock to you to see the three resignations in four days? Uh, Look, I think it was a shock to to everyone. Uh, You know, the rumour mill is there's more to come and obviously uh, the Nats now have to realign themselves as well. So... uh, our state parliamentary colleagues have got a busy week ahead of them. Absolutely, without doubt. Now, obviously, uh, Dominic Perrottet can't really do anything with his cabinet until after tomorrow's uh, vote for who the uh, the Nats will will vote in their leader. Can they really? He can't really touch that until after that's happened. No, but I think similarly to, to probably the federal uh, team, there's portfolios that normally sit within uh, each sort of party room. So he can probably start to have a good think about what he wants to do and how he's going to present his new cabinet going forward. Uh, But obviously he will have to wait to see who the new National Party leader is to ensure that, you know, they're they're working uh, in sync together and uh, ensuring that they've got uh, everyone on the same page, which I'm sure they will. You know, it always seems... Uh, a big deal at the time, but give it at 24, 36 hours, things will settle mm. down and uh, and we'll be back on. And it really was devastating to uh, to listen to that one o'clock media conference from Gladys Berejiklian on Friday. You could tell how hard that decision was for her. And uh, once again, it just shows that uh, ICAC should be held behind closed doors and not actually any of its reporting should happen after they've done their hearing in private, not like what they're doing again at the moment. We've, we've lost another leader on on a, uh, an inquiry that hasn't even been held yet. No, and this is the thing about ICAC is they really operate on a guilt by accusation premise. And this is where we see people's lives turned upside down and careers ruined. And uh, the other problem that we have with these public hearings is the timeline that they have on the reporting because they've said that the hearings that they want to hold around uh, the former Premier are going to take around 10 days. Uh, But there's no timeline on what their reporting is. And we know that they've taken four to five years to report at times. And people are living under the shadow of these allegations for extended periods of time, ultimately in most cases to be cleared. The volume of DPP prosecutions that are actually, you know, occur and are referred through are absolutely minimal, absolutely minimal in the numbers compared to the damage that they do to people's reputations and their careers. So I do think that when we look at these things, you know, the Hong Kong model was what was used to set up ICAC, but the one part they removed was, that they did differently was holding public hearings versus them private. And I do think... Yes, we need to be able to investigate uh, allegations of corruption, but we cannot have something that's used as a star chamber that has no accountability and destroys people's reputation without seeing, you know, if you want to call it a success rate uh, of, of prosecutions. It's just outrageous. And in the midst of this pandemic, I think what has been also said to me by a couple of people is these are historic allegations. This is not something that's going to change. This is something that's two, three, four years old or whatever the timeline is. So why now? What's what's the imperative for now when we're a week from opening up? What's the imperative for now when we're in the midst of a pandemic? I just think there needs to be questions asked as to what the motivation is behind the why, the where, the when uh, in how this is being conducted. I agree completely with you. As somebody who had their name besmirched in March of one year and could not appear before and could not speak and could not defend themselves until I had to stand in, you know, I could stand in in that box on the 17th of August, I had to live under, you know, this stigma that I'd done something wrong and I could not say a word about it. I could not defend myself. And the way that they do this is just so wrong. And as you said, the report that came out about the Newcastle situation, it was three years later. I know mm. I, I was very lucky. I, I actually had 
at that point in time, Jodie McKay and myself, I think, were the only two people that uh, that the lovely, uh, yeah, whoever was in charge of ICAC at the time actually said, uh, you know, th- these two, two women are innocent. Other than that, I would have had to have waited three years for that report. It's bloody tough, Holly. That That is not how we should be, be doing our justice system. Our justice system is innocent until proven guilty, whereas yeah. ICAC operates on guilty until proven innocent. Mm-hmm. That's exactly that's exactly right, and this is why people are forced to step down, step aside, and in Gladys's case, resign. Not only from the, the uh, being premier, but also from her seat in Parliament. It is a massive loss for New South Wales, mm. and I, you know, what we don't know what's going to come out. I have confidence that she will ultimately be cleared. Uh, what sort of apology will be then granted to her? And I can assure you, it'll be nothing. No, and never is. probably clearing her name. Uh, I'd suggest we won't be hearing anything for a substantial number of years because uh, that's how long they can take to report and hope that everyone's forgotten by this. Because the anger in the community is palpable. I mean, mm. you can feel it. Um, the number of people that I had call me who are not Liberal Party members, they're not people that know Gladys, they're not people like, for me on Friday, it was, you know, it was a friend. Mm. Um but for some people who don't even know her but just have admired her strength, have admired her courage, have seen the way that she has brought New South Wales through the pandemic and led this country. I mean, she has absolutely led the way. And if anyone was in any doubt, the short, sharp lockdown that they did in Victoria when everyone was louding down Andrews for the short, sharp lockdown, look where they are now. Mm. I mean, they, they can't... It's like they almost have to beat New South Wales at everything, and they've now beaten the national record of cases in mm. one day. Um, and, you know, we were open for an extended period of time that people criticised Gladys for. Our cases are lower, our vaccination rates are higher, and our hospitals have coped. And I think this is an important thing to note. The New South Wales parliamentary team, whether it's been under Gladys, Mike, Barry, and, and under Hazard as, as health minister, have continued to invest in our health system, in our hospitals, to make sure that whilst this pandemic's been going on, our hospitals are still being coping. We've got a situation in WA and Queensland where they don't even have COVID and they've already got significant ramping issues at the moment because the state government's investment in their hospital system is absolutely lacking on every count. The federal investment in those hospitals, in some instances in WA, is four times the amount. Mm. that the states have invested and increased their percentage of funding. So we have to see what, you know, Gladys and this team has done to ensure New South Wales is on track. And ICAC's behaviour and tearing it down, I think, is absolutely appalling. The timing is what uh, what gets me. That That's the main thing, and I think that's what everybody else is, is upset about. Now, these vaping laws have changed, effective from Friday. Yep. Can you unpack and explain those changes to us? Yeah, so in a lot of ways, they haven't changed. Technically, you have always required a prescription to import nicotine. It's just been something that kind of hasn't really been very regulated. It hasn't been something that's been kind of overly mandated. What happened was back last year, sorry, about 14, 15 months ago, the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, federally tried to ban what we call the personal importation scheme. So that meant you could no longer import uh, liquid nicotine or vapes or pods of uh, nicotine to go in vaping devices. Now, the problem with that was we actually was not legal to sell nicotine or vape in Australia. So we already had a black market. Mm-hmm. There was already these cheap Chinese disposable vapes coming in. But people who were really using them for smoking cessation were buying them overseas under a regulated market, particularly in New Zealand, but sometimes in the US or the UK. So Greg Hunt tried to uh, abolish the personal importation scheme. That was met with some uh, very uh, strong resistance from the coalition party room. I was one of the, I think it was 42 of us, that signed a letter saying this isn't on, this never came to the party room. At that stage, I didn't really know anything about voting. And uh, I ended up chairing an inquiry into, it was called tobacco harm reduction, but it was uh, around vaping fundamentally. The recommendations that were made by Matt Canavan and myself, so even as chair, we ended up in a dissenting report because mm-hmm. the Labor Party and the Greens uh, opposed vaping point blank. Uh, but we suggested that vape, vaping and this sort of material for smoking cessation be regulated in the same way cigarettes and alcohol are. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to the liquor store or you go to buy cigarettes, you have to be over 18, you have to show ID and there's regulations around it. 
Unfortunately, the model they've gone with is this prescription model to be mandated and regulated. So mm. you can still import from overseas. You actually now can purchase it in Australia. There are uh, pharmacies and companies that you can now purchase through in Australia. Uh, but you have to do it with a prescription now. Now, the issue around that is that there are only so many doctors that are approved to prescribe nicotine. The TGA did tell us at the last Senate estimates that they were, uh, that any doctor could prescribe nicotine. The problem is GPs don't really understand vaping. They mm. don't really understand its success as a smoking cessation tool. And they don't know how to prescribe it. So uh, I've been working with, we've put together on my website another page for people how to vape and how to... Thank God refer, for you, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> ...refer their uh, GPs and how they can become prescribers of it. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it in the sense that I'm, I'm one of the anecdotes. Lots mm. of people like to dismiss vaping as, you know, it's their, their anecdotal story. Uh, we, during the inquiry, had around 500,000 plus Australian vapors sort of identified that had used it to quit smoking. Uh, the TGA estimates last go when I asked them about how their campaign was going to alert people that they uh, needed to get this prescription. Uh, Professor Skerritt told me that they had set up a Facebook uh, campaign and had over 2 million individual hits. And while mm. Professor Skerritt uh, questioned whether or not there were 500,000 vapors, I think the 2 million individual hits, as I suggested to him, may suggest there might be actually a few more than 500,000. Yes, 000. exactly. Um, but I had no intention of quitting being a social mm. smoker and thought I'd try this vaping thing out, and I haven't had a cigarette now for almost 400 days. So, Wow. You know, there, there's um, the proof, yeah. Yeah, and look, lots of it, they, they are. Uh, I think they're around fifty-five percent more successful than any other uh, smoking cessation tool. Uh, they do lead people to move on from nicotine, and also, you know, we know cigarettes bad for you. Cigarettes mm. have seven thousand carcinogens in them. We know how bad they are. The concern here is that if people can't get a prescription, that they might go back to smoking. And you know, if you go to the UK. They actually move people on to vaping. You know, pregnant women that go in that, that are smoking still, they mm. move them on to vaping. They have vaping areas within hospitals. They sell vaping in vaping gear in hospitals to move people away from cigarettes. Wow. Um, somehow or other, our regulators here think that UK lungs are different from Australian lungs uh, because they have a very anti-position across the board here towards vaping. Uh, the argument that quite often they put is that nicotine is particularly bad. It's nicotine that's the, the very bad poison. Nicotine's in eggplants. Nicotine's mm. in tomatoes. You can buy nicotine patches, sprays, lozenges, gum at the supermarket at the height that kids can reach. With yeah, no age restriction. exactly. So if it's, the, the consistency around the nicotine is bad, uh, I don't think stands up at all. And look, a lot of these patches, a lot of these sort of nicotine replacement therapies uh, originally started on prescription and have now moved to what they call Schedule 4 or have moved to consumer products, I very much hope that we start to see vaping move in that direction, particularly for people that want to quit smoking and people that want to stay off the cigarettes. Um, there's also studies, you know, the argument is vaping is a ramping on tool to uh, cigarettes. I mean, I, the no. statistics don't back that up. Teen smoking is dropping. Uh, so that proves, and, and in fact, adult smoking in that younger age group is dropping, which demonstrates that people that have vaped have not moved on to sweat. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine why if you tried something like a vape in a, I don't know, a blueberry flavour or a mm. tropical flavour or something, that you'd then go to a tobacco cigarette because I can tell you now the smell of them or the sort of one just makes me ill. Mm. Um, but the numbers don't back it up. The, the, the smoking levels are not increasing. Smoking is going down. We are not seeing teens taking up smoking. And in fact, a lot of these kids that take up vaping, I mean, trust me, when we were teenagers, teenagers yeah. try stuff. That's exactly. what they do. And we need to let them try it safely. That's that's the whole idea. Try it safely. Well, look, we, Matt Canavan and I wanted to see the banning of these Chinese importations, which are the you know twenty bucks disposable vapes that taste like pineapple. That was they were what we wanted to ban. Uh, but these regulations actually haven't done that. You're going to see an increase in the black market come through because that's what happens when you push people in this direction. Uh, but I would encourage people to talk to their GP. 
if they can't find a GP who will prescribe to, to let my office know, to go to our website because we are going to keep on this. It is important that people are vaping and not smoking. Don't go back to cigarettes because we know they will kill you. Absolutely. Listen, thank you so much for your time and thank you for being so open about the fact that you did use vaping to uh, to get off cigarettes because I think it's really important that we do have personal anecdotes about how successful it is. Thank you so much for your time. Stay safe, won't you? Have a good day. Thank you, you too. Thank you. That is Senator Holly Hughes. And uh, yeah, if you want to know more details about vaping, if you go to hollyhughes.com.au, it is all there.